has one of those new cars that drives itself. You have a Tesla? Cool. It's driving for you, isn't it? Nice. <laughs> no, you have Miss Carlene. I know what you I know what you have. You have Miss Carlene. No Tesla. Good morning. Good morning. Are you out there? <laughs> it's great to see you this morning. Welcome to worship. Those of you that are joining us from home, we want to welcome you as well. Um, my name is Kim Prisky, and I'm here with the worship team to um, invite you in. So let's praise him together. He is good, he is mighty, and he is here. to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creations. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. To the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Christ, who has 
has resurrected me. Amen. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, the One, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress.
vacant Leinster can be calmed and broken for my Scott Prisky, you know my wife Kim, I'm one of the elders here at the church, and as you know, she's one of the worship leaders here. Um, we're filling in this morning for Dale Earlywine uh, for communion meditation, he's homesick. Uh, if you want to keep him and Teresa in your prayers, um, that would be appreciated, I'm sure. Uh, here at the church, when we do communion, uh, we use these little communion kits that are prepackaged. They are by the uh, door as you came in this morning to the, to the church. Um, if you didn't get one and you want to take communion with us, just raise your hand. We'll make sure somebody gets one of those for you. Um, what I'm going to do, or what we're going to do this morning, is we're going to read a little scripture. I'm going to lead us in prayer. And we're going to sit down, have a few minutes of quiet time when you can take your communion kit 
and, uh, and have a few minutes of, of quiet time. So. Mark 14, 12 through 25. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who portrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for putting on skin, coming to this earth, living the perfect life that we should have lived, earning us the opportunity to come to heaven and be with you. Thank you for allowing yourself to be tortured to death on a cross to pay the price for our sins, the punishment that we deserved. God, thank you for loving us more than we possibly could imagine. And I'm out of just immense gratitude, appreciation, awe, and wonder, I pray that you help each one of us, Lord, to love you way that you deserve to be loved. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor John here from the church, and uh, I would love to be with you this morning, but like many others, I'm dealing with uh, runny nose and cough, and I don't think I have COVID, but I don't know, and so I just didn't want to come today and get anybody else sick if I've got something more than just a cold going on, and so uh, I'm here tonight, Saturday night with Megan, and we're going to record the sermon to play for all of you. And uh, today we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy 3. That's one of those great texts that we, uh, we've been given by Paul, the apostle, to look at leadership. John Maxwell has authored several books on leadership, and he has made the statement that everything rises and falls on leadership. And we see that play out in a lot of different areas. We see that play out in businesses. <clears throat> Usually if a business has a good leader, they do well. If not, they tend to fail. Um, maybe a good boss or supervisor that you have had really makes a difference uh, for you. Or you're in that position of being a boss or a supervisor, and you know that if you lead well, uh, other people want to follow you. Um, we see it in politics today. I'm sure we can all think of a political leader who is both good and political leader who is bad. And we can see the, maybe the reasons why we thought that. Maybe they weren't successful at doing things very well or they led through very difficult circumstances, and uh, we can be thankful for their leadership. Uh, we see it in sports. I'm wearing my Kansas City uh, Chiefs sweatshirt, uh, watch the game tonight, and uh, we see that a lot of times with coaches or quarterbacks or maybe a defensive leader. We'll see that in teams that they do well. <clears throat> and we uh, see this in people who have influenced different cultures. Maybe they were a a citizen who just spoke out, like a Martin Luther King, or a Frederick Douglass, or uh, even someone like a, a Nelson Mandela, or a Gandhi, someone like that who really took a stand and led other people and influenced them uh, for change. And when it comes to the church, I'm convinced that everything rises and falls on leadership. I mean, there's a lot of things that are changing in our culture. Uh, things that are unusual. Uh, I never dreamed two years ago that I'd be videotaping worship services to have them to play on a Sunday morning. Uh, and so there's things that are constantly going to be changing in, in the life of our church just because the church isn't static or stagnant. But something that stays the same, something that needs to be solid for the church to, to really be effective for the church to have strength is leadership, good leadership. And so we're going to look at, uh, at this text in 1 Timothy 3. Uh, when we think about leadership, one thing I like to remind people is one person cannot lead a good church for a long period of time by themselves. They need other people working with them, whether it's a small church or a very large church. And we're going to look at some of those leaders that help uh, someone like me, who's often given the task, of being the leader of a congregation or someone who guides and directs or speaks at least for the leadership. Uh, I need people around me, and I'm blessed with that here, uh, people that can help me lead well and who lead our church well. And so uh, <coughs> we're going to talk about leadership for a couple of reasons. Uh, we were supposed to have Leadership Ordination Sunday today. That's put off to next week as several people are sick right now and won't be able to be here today. Uh, but we also need to be reminded that all of us can effectively lead others, and we have a responsibility in that that God has given us. Uh, so, and that uh, affects our roles in ministry here, and that affects our roles in outreach of the church. So first, let's talk about leaders who function in official roles here. And there's a couple here listed in the text. I'm gonna to touch on uh, the first one first, of course and that is elders. And if you read in the book of Acts in the Bible, uh, every place Paul goes, he appoints elders. Uh, he appoints them to lead the church. What he doesn't do is appoint pastors. He doesn't appoint ministers. He as a minister and other people who were ministers or pastors or evangelists, they would travel from church to church. The leadership during uh, Paul's time at the very beginning of the church rested on elders. And so the position of elder is very important for the life of any church. And so 
uh, something about me and how I function. If you look a couple chapters over from 1 Timothy 3, if you look in chapter 5 of this letter that Paul writes, verses 17 through 20, uh, Tim, Timothy is told about or, or let known that there are some elders who function in roles where their task is preaching and teaching. So in a way, I function as a paid elder. I don't uh, necessarily uh, have the same level of leadership in all things, but usually when we make decisions here in the congregation and elders meetings for the good of the congregation, we're all on board, we're all in agreement, we're all w moving forward together. And so Paul, when he writes this, he's been appointing elders in all these churches. He wants Timothy, his protege, protege to know how important this is. And so he gives a list of qualifications for elder. Here's the first one in verse 1 of 1 Timothy 3. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. And so it has to be something, if someone's going to serve in the capacity of elder and even in the capacity of deacon, they have to desire, they have to want to do it. Uh, and it can't be something that someone just feels like they have to do, they're compelled to do. They need to have a desire to lead and to guide. They can't be reluctant about it. Uh, because those who lead will have a greater scrutiny uh, and because of the responsibility placed on them uh, when we stand before God, when we are judged by Him. Uh, the text also gives us a key phrase and then lists some things underneath it that I think help us evaluate uh, good leaders. It's in verses 2 and 3. It says, Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So what we need to hear in that is right at the start of verse 2, that they have to be above reproach. Everything else in the text flows from that. Uh, everything else about leadership has to be tied to that being above reproach. <clears throat> and there are some things that they should be, and there are some things that they should not be, or things they should avoid. We have that list here. And I'm thankful here that we have elders that are solid when it comes to being leaders who are above reproach. Uh, I have great confidence and trust in them. I hope that you do as well. If you don't know them, uh, they're the guys that get up and give us the communion thoughts right before we take communion every week. They might serve for a period of time and then have a break. Uh, or uh, And next week we're going to ordain a new elder to serve in that capacity. But these guys are responsible for the affairs and the direction of the church. And uh, I'm glad to have them uh, with me as we lead the congregation. Uh, there should also be some observable qualities of leading. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says he must manage his own family well <clears throat> and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his, his own family, how can he take care of God's church? And so there's a word there that probably you're wondering about, at least... When I've read this, that's the word manage. Kind of sounds like, you know, it's their job, they do this. But remember, if this is an office they desire, if this is something that they uh, want to do, uh, we really don't want them to just then be managers that just kind of go, well, you got to do this and this and this. The word is probably better translated care for. We need people who are elders who will care for us as a congregation, uh, care for each other. And so when we look at them, do they care for their own family well? Can we measure that? Uh, Paul also concludes his list with a couple more essential qualities, verses 6 and 7. He says he must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I find it interesting that Satan, uh, the, the devil, is mentioned twice there in those two verses. And, and so there's kind of a warning there uh, that we need to pay attention to when we're thinking about who to select for leadership to serve in the capacity of elder. It can't be someone new to the faith. For us to put them in that role or that position, that would be wrong of us to do that. 
And so we need to um, make sure they're mature in the faith, that they can lead well. They also need to have a good reputation in the community. That means people know them and see them for who they are. They not only have a good reputation in the church, but as leaders of the church, they represent it well in their everyday relationships. And so when we come to select elders, uh, we really need to look at these qualifications and ask uh, all these questions. Do they, someone who we're going to nominate as an elder, is someone we're going to approve as an elder, do they match up? Do they have these qualifications? Why is that important? <clears throat> when uh, Jill and I lived in Joplin, Missouri, uh, I had graduated uh, college and we were newly married and I would go from uh, different churches, smaller churches, and be what's termed a supply preacher. They might need someone for a week <clears throat> or a series of weeks. And so I went to one church that was over uh, about two, three, four hours away. I forget how far away it was. Um, but it was kind of intimidating for me to go there because some of the professors at the school were also going there and being a part of the preaching rotation. And so uh, uh, what I didn't know about that was that they were going because this church was having some issues. Uh, they had just fired their last pastor. He had only been there for six months. And uh, so they were just kind of like, what's going on? We can't seem to be able to keep a minister for any length of time. And as time went on and the, these professors worked with um, this church and talked with their leadership, they found out that in the 1950s, this was in the 90s at this point, in the 1950s, if it was male and walked on two feet, they would make it an elder. They didn't follow these qualifications. And so they had put a lot of people in leadership that were not good choices. And they were paying a price for it. So uh, when we look at this list here, when we think about all the things that um, men should be to serve as an elder, and I do think this uh, leadership role is reserved for men specifically um, we uh, we need to remember guys that we shouldn't default leadership to the ladies we need to step up and take leadership and fulfill the roles that God gives us and not just kind of go well they'll kind of take care of it or this can take place or we don't really need to worry about this because one of the ladies groups is going to take care of it uh, if we are selecting people as, for elders, men as elders, uh, that's good because, guys, we need to not shirk that responsibility. But at the same time, all of us men can be striving to ma measure up to this list. I think all the ladies in here would agree with me that if their husbands met all of these qualifications as a husband, they'd be thrilled with that. And so, uh, men, we need to be growing in our faith. Uh, doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but we need to strive to become this kind of man, and we can do it if we let God work in us. <coughs> Excuse me. We also see this chap in this chapter that it talks about another kind of leader, and that's the second one on our list, and that is deacons. And so deacons... Uh, they uh, typically had service responsibilities. Um, they didn't always have the same level of responsibility as elders did. Um, but they had a need to, needed to have lo a lot of the same qualities. And their ministry was just as important. They're not second string leaders. Uh, they're valuable parts of the church. They're just leaders with a different focus than the elders. And something else to remember about this I've been in some churches where church leadership has looked at, well, let's try them out as a deacon and see if they're elder material. Well, that may not always work out for the best. That might not always be something uh, that's, that's right. Uh, someone who's very good at being a deacon may never really be very good at being an elder, and vice versa. Um, but uh, in this chapter, there's responsibilities here for deacons and uh, look at verse 8 with me it says in the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect sincere and not indulging in much wine and not pursuing 
dishonest gain. Pay attention to that phrase at the start of this in the same way. So there's some connection back to the qualifications that the elders have. And so here we have some of the same qualities of, as elders, worthy of respect, sincere, self-controlled, honest, but they're also to be growing in their faith, just like the elders are. Elders aren't, haven't arrived yet. That's not why they hold that position. Um, we're all supposed to continue to grow, um, but these men are to be growing in their faith. And then verses 9 and 10. It says they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. So again, I think what we're talking about is not new Christians, not someone who's just joined the church three weeks ago and we need someone to serve this pl- fill this spot and serve as a deacon. Let's pick Ralph and stick him in there and go with it. That's not what that means. Uh, they need to be someone who's growing in their faith, uh, someone who has a clear conscience that we need to test them, make sure they have some of these qualities and uh, make sure they're good. Then skip from verse 10 to verse 12, because there's one more thing that it says about deacons. And then we'll come back and look at verse 11. Verse 12 says, A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and household well. So again, you have that term manage that shows up. Again, the best way I believe to, to translate that is to care for. We need to have someone who knows how to care for their family. Because again, the church body here is intended to be God's family. We are his body. We, are, we belong to each other. And, and just like every other family, we aren't always perfect. We don't always get along all the time. Most of the time we do. But there might be an issue here or there that needs to be resolved. You might have to have a family meeting and deal with something and, and work it out. And all those things, I believe, uh, I, I don't think really encountered many problems in ministry that can't be resolved if people are willing to, to work at being, uh, working for a good resolution for the conflict that they're in. And so, <clears throat> again, these men who hold places of leadership in our church, uh, they're men. They should not forfeit their responsibilities to others. Again, guys, we need to step up. We need to lead. Our wives are looking for men like this. But, now let's go back and verse, look at verse 11. It says, In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. I've often heard uh, pastors preach on this verse that this is just speaking about the wives of the elders and deacons. I don't think it is. I think it's talking about all the women, and it has this phrase in the same way. So ladies, this verse is for you. Uh, I think this is where you become a part of the leadership of the church as well. Some churches have official titles for this, and it's called a deaconess. And while we don't have an official office for that here on our church board, uh, I don't know that we couldn't, We just haven't amended our bylaws to do something like that. We haven't got to that point yet. But uh, the text says, in the same way, for all you ladies. So all of you need to be worthy of respect. Be above reproach. Lead others well. Maxwell also said this in one of his leadership books. He said, everyone leads, on average, each day, five other people. So no matter who it is in the room, even our kids lead other children. Maybe our infants, maybe our smallest children don't. But on average, most people lead five other people a day. And you can see women who did this effectively in the Bible, who had places of leadership and served well. Uh, In Acts chapter 9, verses 36 and 37, You can go look at that text. It talks about a woman named Dorcas who was serving others, caring for the poor. And so uh, the text says she was always doing good. And she had passed away. She had died. And people were really upset about that because she was making a difference in the church and outside of the church. She was leading. She was valuable to their ministry. 
In Luke 8, 1 through 3, Luke lists off a group of women who were supporting Jesus in his ministry, both by being present, by being with him, uh, maybe caring for and ministering the needs to other women that came up and talked with Jesus, because there would be a little bit of a cultural barrier there, and these women could, could minister in Jesus' name to these uh, other ladies who were coming to hear him, but they were also supporting him financially. And Luke points this out. In, in Luke 8, 1 through 3, it says, they're very valuable. They make a difference. And so all of us should be striving to serve in whatever role or capacity that we're given. We've all been gifted by the Holy Spirit. We all have responsibilities. We all have expectations, I believe, that come from God, from his word, for us to be serving. And so uh, we need to embrace our gift, serve each other, and our community. And and verse 13 kind of gives us a good reason why. It says, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So how we serve makes a difference uh, eternally for each one of us, but I think it also makes a difference eternally for each other here and for people outside of our church body. And that's why I just want to say the last group of leaders I want to talk about simply is us. It's all of us. It's not just some of us. It's not just the elders. It's not just the deacons. It's not just me as a pastor. It's not people that have roles or responsibilities here in the church building that might teach or lead a group or be up here on stage to lead worship. That's not it. It's not just limited to those people. It's all of us. And for someone to come to faith in Jesus, someone else has to lead them. They have to lead them. Because that's the only way they come to know him. And for someone to walk faithfully with other believers as we follow Jesus together, again, someone probably has to be uh, leading others. There might be others who will fall away if we don't help them and walk with them and lead them and encourage them. And so we all have great responsibility for that. And so uh, I think we have a lot of leaders here. Some are just have official places of leadership and others Come here, sit in a pew, spend time here, encourage other people, lead from a a non-official role and make just as big a difference as people like me. So let's talk about our head, heart, and hands questions. I was going to, uh, tomorrow or today, have all of us kind of get in little groups of two or three and talk about these different questions with each other. And I might encourage you that maybe you want to do that after church with someone else when the service is done. Or maybe you want to do that at home with your spouse or with your husband and wife, kids, uh, with your family. Uh, I I think there's good value in talking about about these things together. And next week, week we're going to start discipleship groups. And we're going to go down in the fellowship hall after the worship service, and we're going to talk about this. And we're already making plans to have Uh, groups for uh, our kids. If we don't feel like they can be with the adults, we're going to accommodate them, make sure that we're teaching them because discipleship, how to follow Jesus, what that means, uh, how we can teach others how to follow Jesus, uh, because that's what we're commanded to do by God. That's something all of us can grow in. All of us can continue learning that, and we especially need to be teaching that to our children. And so, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask these three questions. They're going to appear on the screen. And I'm just going to give you what my answer would be. I was going to share this with you, but I'll just do it over video and maybe it'll prime you thinking. And so, uh, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. First question, what are the qualities Paul lists? Uh, why, why are the qualities Paul lists necessary for leaders in the church. Why are those qualities necessary? And I just said this, because I need to not only care for all of you well, but I need to be able to care for others outside of the church. I want to build up each other up so that we can effectively reach people outside this body of believers. I also want to be authentic in my faith. 
I don't want to look faith, fake. I don't want to look good here, but not in other relationships outside of this place. I want it to be clear who I am as I follow Jesus, because that needs to be shown so that others might want to know more about him, and so that I can have integrity in my relationships with all of you. So that's how I would answer question number one. (coughs) Excuse me. Question number two, Uh, what is one quality in 1 Timothy 3 that you want to see growth in in your life this coming year? You might have noticed that when I answered that first question, I used a lot of I's and me's. Because when I think about these questions, I need to think about how I need to change. I'm the only person I can change. I can't change any of you. I can only change me. And so uh, here's my answer to this question. I, I want to make sure that I care for my family well. I find that I fail at times in treating and leading my family as well as I know I should. I need God to continue growing me so that I am self-controlled, gentle, and caring so that they know I love them as I lead them to follow Jesus. I need them to see the love of God in my life and that it helps me love them the way that they want, need, and deserve to be loved by me. I'm not perfect in this area, and I want God to help me grow in this. And then third question. How do you think having these qualities that are listed here uh, in this chapter in 1 Timothy 3 can help you help others learn how to follow God to be a disciple? Here's my answer. If I let God grow me and guide me and help me become more and more like the leader Paul describes here, I think it will help me show Jesus to others, to care for them well, and to have compassion for those who are lost and don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I need to remember that God gives me spiritual gifts to not only build up the body, but grow the kingdom. How others see me is a direct reflection on who God is to me, and that will influence whether or not they are open to following God. And so, as we think about this chapter, we probably look at it and go, well, this is a chapter all about leadership. And I guess I think of it as a chapter that teaches us how to be better disciples and how to influence others and lead them to know Jesus if they see this in us. And now that we know that, we have to be obedient to what we know. Uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible that I haven't spent a lot of time studying on, probably because there's a lot of things that I already know that I need to keep working on, keep growing in. And so, being this kind of leader, whether it's me or you, or as we do it together, it's really important that we are above reproach, that we are reflecting God in everything that we do, and we lead each other, and we lead others well, because ultimately we're leading people to know Jesus, to have eternal life in him. Uh, And and so next week, we're going to start in, we're going to dig into uh, uh, these groups, uh, dig into how Jesus discipled other people. If it's not in your bulletin, write down uh, John, the Gospel of John, Chapter 1, verses 19 through 51, we're going to look at that together. I'll preach from part of that, not all of that. Um, But we will look at that text and talk about what it means to be a disciple. And uh, we're also going to have our ordination service for our elders and deacons next Sunday. So I hope that you'll plan to join us next week. And I hope that this message has encouraged you and blessed you and challenged you to become more and more like Jesus. And this gives us some very practical ways that we can do that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day that we can just be here with you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for how you gift us, how you design us, how you make us to work together, how to fit together. Lord, we all need to be responsible. We all need to be using our gifts because if any one of us don't, we're less effective. And so, Lord, I'm thankful for those 
uh, people who have official leadership roles here. I'm thankful for others who um, just serve out of love, who guide and direct and, and teach uh, and, and pour themselves things they've learned about you into others so that we can all continue to grow to be more like him. Lord, I thank you for uh, technology that allows us to still be together today, and I look forward to all the things that you're going to do through us in the coming weeks and months and years. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day, everyone.